Thanks, everybody. Welcome. I'd like to welcome our panelists to come up to the stage. Thank you very much. We're going to move this along. I, I trust you had a lovely lunch, and we don't want that, uh, that post-lunch crash to settle in, so we're going to keep this informative and interesting. Uh, so what we'd like to do is I'm going to just have each of our panelists start with a, a very brief introduction of themselves, where they work, and just their role um, at their workplace, and then we'll jump right into some questions. So we'll start on the far end uh, with Joffrey. Hello, everyone. My name is Joffrey Wilson, and I serve as Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Mortensen. Uh, the company is based here in Minneapolis and focuses in three different spaces, commercial construction, commercial real estate development, and then energy infrastructure. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michelle Anderson. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Global Learning and Development and Diversity. I primarily focus on learning and development from a global workforce. I work at Amtrust Financial. We have about 6,500 people in a global audience, and we are a small business commercial insurance carrier. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Siham. I lead strategic accounts and partnerships at Praxis Labs. And Praxis Labs is an immersive learning company that focuses on helping people leaders in particular build some of the fundamental skills around inclusive leadership. And so we think about how you can leverage role play based simulations as a safe way to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Renee Rice. I am the Senior Director of Communications and Culture at Marvin Windows. We are a 112-year-old um, family-owned company uh, based up on the Canadian border up in War Road, Minnesota, if anyone's ever been there. Um, specifically within my team, we focus a lot on communications, culture, change management, um, people analytics, and really all of that ladders up to a cohesive employee experience. So that's kind of the realm that, that my team resides in. Thanks. And finally, Bethany. Hi, everyone. My name is Bethany Kerbis. I work with the Bailey Group, which is a Twin Cities-based executive coaching and consulting firm. I'm a senior executive coach and consultant with them. Uh, the group of the Bailey Group is comprised of experienced senior leaders who have sat in the seats of leadership and also have deep experience in coaching as well. And so that's what we do uh, in the Twin Cities and across the country with, with some international folks as well. Great. Well, let's just jump right into um, our discussion for this afternoon. And I first want to start uh, with a question for Joffrey. And, and let's start by looking at just some of the barriers that exist for um, for hiring and retaining talent, uh, talent and of uh, folks who are from underrepresented communities. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of people um, who maybe identify as neurodiverse. Of course, there are all kinds of people who come from um, other backgrounds. Just give me a, your sense. I'm interested in your perspective. What are some strategies that, that you've implemented um, to attract talent from these different communities and um, create a more uh, a, a pipeline that, that's diverse in, in, in hiring these folks? Well, the first thing I'll talk about is in terms of barriers, I think at previous employers as well, and looking at Mortenson, a lot of times we've looked in the similar places where we've recruited in the past and getting similar results. Um, we've tried to address that barrier in a couple different ways. So partnering with HSIs and HBCUs, I think there's a lot of opportunity that exists there. So as we're looking for folks in construction management and engineering, partnering with schools that we haven't traditionally gone to has proven to be beneficial. I'd say a second thing that we focused on is what internally we call national outreach partnerships. And what that means for us is partnering with professional organizations where we can find a lot of diverse talent in one place. So an example would be the National Society of Black Engineers, National Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, or Society of Asian Professionals. That allows us in a scalable way to not only engage in the three-day conference with a career fair, but throughout the year to develop our own diverse talent, but also bring in talent. The last thing that I'll share is we think we have to tell a better story as it pertains to construction. Um, they don't talk about trades or that path in schools today. Um, so we spend time making sure we introduce youth to construction and engineering a lot earlier, partnering with organizations like ACE Mentoring across the country where we can uh, provide internship experience and mentorship opportunities to youth and high schools across the U.S. Right. Um, I want to uh, shift the question now to, to Renee. Um, we had a chance to talk um, 
last week or so, just like kind of preparing for our discussion today. And we were talking about, uh, and you'd mentioned that, that there's this, the interconnectedness between um, retention and recruitment. Uh, obviously, you can, you can hire all kinds of great um, folks, but you want to make sure they stay. So I, I'm, I'm, I want to get your perspective on um, how you think leaders can approach this um, and, and be able to uh, attract and retain this, this uh, talent that's, that's so crucial. Yeah, well, a lot of us have probably been faced with uh, hiring challenges, especially over the last several years um, with the great resignation. And I think a lot of companies have defaulted to really focusing on hiring because that is sort of an easier, theoretically an easier path. But when you look at it, and if you actually calculate the cost of turnover, it's probably costing your organization a lot more money to hire and then the cost of turnover is equating to pretty significant costs. And so when you think about hiring and retention together, really it is about that cohesive employee experience. And um, for us at Marvin, we have been very intentional about thinking about um, not only what that experience looks like, but specifically identifying the moments that matter. And those moments that matter are gonna look different for every organization. They look different from for us than maybe they do for other companies. And so that starts with understanding your audiences. So not just a description of the job and the capabilities, but truly understanding what your employees want, what motivates them, and then matching those audience profiles with specific moments along that employee experience. And one specific way that, that we've really focused um, on retention is through um, strengthening our recognition programs. And some of us were in a workshop earlier where we've talked a lot about recognition. And for us, that has really come to life in um, establishing not only a strong recognition program, but making sure that that recognition is rooted in our company values, our purpose, and really what we want to see as a business. And that's where we've truly found that sweet spot of doing what works well for the employees while also reinforcing some of our core values. Right. Um, a question for, for uh, Bethany. We're going to talk a little bit about um, HR. Obviously, it's it's a pretty familiar term. I've, it's it's one of the many, many, um, I've not even uh, abbreviations that we use um, in all sectors of the business world. Um, but sometimes spelling out uh, the human aspect of human resources uh, can be challenging with, I mean, you've got a lot of different perspectives coming together uh, to drive your, the growth of your businesses and transform your businesses. So I'm, I'm curious to get your perspective on uh, how leaders can adopt a more inclusive and human approach when thinking about their strategy of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm gonna start by answering your question by telling uh, a quick story about my origin in HR. Um, I had the incredible privilege and honor to move to Southern Sudan before it was the New Republic of Southern Sudan. And um, I was doing peaceful conflict resolution uh, with returning refugee uh, communities. And we used this modality called forum theater. It's an amazing modality. I highly recommend looking it up. Another word for it is the theater of the oppressed. So naturally, I, I learned about the theater of the oppressed and I chose a career in HR, right? Obviously. <laughs> um, so what happened is I was doing peaceful conflict resolution in, in southern Sudan and I had the opportunity to move to Khartoum. And I had an HR manager in the office reach out to me and she said, hey, I understand you have an experience with conflict resolution. Can you come and help us resolve some conflicts in the office? And I said, happy to. So I sat down and started creating space to have really human discussions. If there's any audience that knows about human beings, it's HR people. <laughs> and it's messy. It's messy to be human. It's nuanced, it's complex. And I literally, this is true, that was, it was about a month where I was sitting down working in some conflicts in that office and I chose to pivot into HR. I'm the only colleague um, of all of my network of humanitarian aid people who chose a career in HR um, and, and I love it. I, I realize the importance of creating space for human messiness. We have to do it, it's gonna happen. The best leaders that we run into create space for humanness. We've heard about that a little bit already, right? We have to create space for the difficult conversations. The best leaders hold that space. They listen to the individual motivators, the drivers, the things that their individual people want. And that takes spaciousness 
to seek to understand, to really listen deeply. And so the way I ended up doing HR was, was from this experience of the theater of the oppressed, the forum theater, which is create space to learn about what's inside somebody. And so I kind of take an H, uh, a coaching approach to HR, um, which by nature creates some space for some messiness. So as far as leaders go, um, the best ones create that space. As, as HR leaders, you understand how busy your, your schedules, your calendars are, and creating that space to, to have the difficult conversations to seek understanding so that we can build everything we've already heard about. It's a good starting point. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to bring Michelle into the conversation. Michelle, you and I also, we had a chance to, to talk a little bit about um, uh, the preparing for the discussion about some of the things that, that you're doing um, and that are important to you. And uh, you did mention the role of leadership. Um, and uh, so I want to touch on that. I think we've already kind of, we've been talking around it, but maybe you can more directly uh, address the, the role that leaders in, in organizations play in fostering a, an atmosphere of inclusion and belonging. Yeah, leaders have a very unique responsibility to foster belonging in the workforce. Um, we are a company, so my company specifically is, we celebrated our 25th anniversary last year. So we're only 26 years old. We are a company of um, acquisitions that kind of came together to, to make one giant company. So what, we're kind of starting from ground zero. And so what we did is we really looked at, we had to identify what a leader meant and what that, what that looked like for us. Um, so we started with kind of the middle manager layer and said, you know, as a leader, uh, we want you to be intentional. And what does intentional mean? Intentional for us means, you know, you're curious and aware. It means you are focused on learning more about the individual, helping them with their development, and uh, having a clear vision, and then also um, being authentic and empathetic. So we spent time actually defining that, and then what we did is created all of our leadership development programs, which range from you know, brand new, I've never been a leader before, all the way up through emerging executives. And everything is with that sole focus in mind. And then we use that and hold people accountable to it. So we've embedded those thought processes in our performance management for leaders in every single aspect of, of training, development, everything that we push out to managers and to leaders to help them be successful people leaders, because they really, if, without a good manager, you know, it's, you're kind of SOL, right? Like <laughs> CEOs can, can push the tone from the top, but the manager is really the one who impacts the culture of the team, and which then in turn impacts the culture of the organization. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just going to build on that. And mm -hmm. one point that I would emphasize, especially when it comes to leadership development, there are there are basic things that all leaders should do and model. You know, fostering trust, um, having courageous conversations, creating that space. But I would also encourage everyone to think about what your business needs from its leaders and what your business needs from its people. And again, every business is unique. And so the more that you can understand truly what your business needs from your people to achieve where the business is headed, the more that your leadership development can be specific to enable those leaders not only to be consistent, but to be modeling and acting in ways that support where your business is headed. Right, and thanks for adding that. I mean, that, that, that leads right into um, a follow-up kind of that I wanted to address to Siham, uh, Siham um, about um, building that internal leadership um, capability among um, members of your organization. And I'd, I'd like you to kind of address what are some um, effective ways uh, or you know, tools and strategies to help build that leadership among um, members of your organization? Yeah, I think it's interesting that you just mentioned people leaders and managers are really like the linchpin of your company culture. And so what we've seen to be the most effective strategies to really drive long-term impact is understanding that managers are busy. And so these training moments have to be integrated into their talent development moments so that we're not talking about inclusive leadership as this like standalone, nice to have DEI check the box, but we're talking about some of the fundamental foundational skills to just help you do your job better 
and ultimately drive higher engaged and higher performing teams. And so really taking an integrated approach to inclusive leadership skill development in the existing talent development moments is one piece. But then the other piece of meeting managers where there are is also thinking about what are the just-in-time resources that you can provide your managers and people leaders as they're having some of these difficult conversations, right? Because a lot of times we leave a one-time training and it's like, yes, that was very useful. But now that I'm facing that situation, I've completely forgot everything I've done in this training three months ago. <laughs> so how do you help create resources that are available to people leaders in the moments that they actually need them and just in time and in their flow of work. I say the other piece to that is like a lot of learning programs kind of stop at awareness. It's a one-time workshop where you get a ton of great information, but in the same way that no one here would go to the gym one time and say, I am now fit, I am now, you know, I am a bodybuilder. Like you have to go multiple times and really build the muscle of inclusive leadership. So how do you help give really practical tips that people can take into their day-to-day -day roles and, and responsibilities, but also continuous practice opportunities where they can build that confidence and opportunity to actually apply the learning. And so for us, for example, we think about immersive experiences as a way to do that in an effective way because you not only get the scale of technology, but you help people, one, build empathy for others in these experiences, but then two, have greater confidence of actually applying the learnings because they're able to practice in a completely psychological safe space where they can learn and fail and do it over again before the stakes are actually high. Mm -hmm. right. And so I'd say those are some of the things and I guess the last thing I'll add is just like taking a super data backed approach. So to your point of like, what is the business outcome? You know, unfortunately, and I think a lot of us can empathize with this, as we're seeing some of the recessionary headwinds in the market, some of the first things that get cut, frankly, are like learning and development programs, mm. unless an organization can clearly understand what is the business outcome that we're driving to and how do some of these investments help us engage and retain our talent to actually drive our business outcomes. And so within inclusive leadership training and, and all training, taking a very like data-backed approach to where you can point to exactly how it's helping drive Great. organizational outcomes is also critical. Well, I'm glad everybody's getting, um, getting warmed up here. And we're gonna, I wanna get some more, um, feel free again to whenever you, um, you have some things to, I want folks to jump in now on this next question especially because this is, um, I'm looking for some examples and initiatives um, that you, your organizations have put in place um, uh, around diversity and inclusion. I'll start with Joffrey and then just open it up with every, to everybody to just to feel free to jump right in. Uh, I'm looking, what are some initiatives um, and programs uh, it, that your company, company has implemented um, to help foster that culture of belonging? Just looking for some specifics. Um, I'm gonna steal uh, the words used before, immersive learning. Um, I think there's a little bit of a different meaning. It's kind of specific within Mortensen, but the story I'll share is that we used to call the work that I'm leading inclusion and diversity, and there was desire to bring in the word equity. And the, the short version of the story was, I think folks could wrap their heads around what diversity was we'd been talking about for a long period of time. They could wrap their heads around um, inclusion. We tried to introduce equity, it was a lot harder. And for a lot of different reasons. I think if you don't understand someone else's experience, um, gaps that may exist or challenges folks may have faced, we can't really get our heads wrapped around equity. So one of the initiatives I'd share that's been really impactful for us was uh, it started with a conversation with our CEO and I shared some stories of what was transpiring on our project sites. And, and maybe it resonated, maybe it didn't. At least in the moment, it didn't seem like it resonated. Um, but actually got an idea from a former colleague to leverage theater to help tell a story of what's actually transpiring in your organization. And we ended up partnering with Pillsbury Theater here in the Twin Cities. They have an initiative called Breaking Ice and they interview team members. Um, they learn your language, they learn your initiatives, and then they actually act it out in front of you. It's a way of showing um, to everyone what's really happening in your organization, somewhat sharing a mirror in front of yourself. Um, and it's been so impactful. We started with our C-suite and then we've worked in different parts of the organization. We've taken them out of town. And that has been a different way um, to build a sense of what equity is, where do we not have equity, what might we do? 
and uh, the last plug I'll give with respect to that, it's not only seeing what's happen in, happening in theatrical form, it's the discussion afterwards that's the most impactful because then it leads to what are you actually gonna do given what you just experienced. Anybody else feel free to, uh, with other examples, what are some things that um, after listening to uh, what Joffrey had to say, are there, are there similar programs that you are, or approaches at your business? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. So we have you know, employee resource groups, which I think a lot of us do. Um, the, the thing about ours is they are 100% employee led and any one can come to us and say like, we're interested in creating this group based on this demographic, this ability, this, you know, any characteristic. And then they can work with us to, to build that. So that is one thing that, you know, I don't know, it's, it's not as, as uh, formal, right? It's led 100% by the employee. Um, something else that we focused on and when my um, boss, she hates it when I call her that, when my leader <laughs> joined the company, she brought with her something called the diversity wheel. And it really talks about the, the different dimensions of diversity. And so for, for us, when we think about insurance, you know, you're, you're normally thinking about a older, white, male dominated industry. And so we tried to bring the diversity wheel together to help people see that even if we might look the same, we're not the same. There are different avenues of diversity that everybody's experiences are different. So we introduce that and incorporate that in all of the things that we do from a DEIV perspective as well. Anybody else want to jump in? I mean, we can, we've got plenty of really good questions, but this is also, this is one of those questions where I think a lot of folks may have some things to say. So. I can chime in, um, and it kind of relates back to um, the earlier question that you were discussing as well. And one thing um, that Marvin has invested more specifically in over the last couple of years is a really strong coaching and mentoring program. And if we know that especially inclusion and belonging really is fostered at that leadership level and with leaders and their peers, um, it's important not only to have strong leadership development, but also to have coaching and mentoring so that when you are applying what you're learning and you're applying these new ways of working and new ways of thinking, that you're getting that real-time feedback and that you have a coach and someone available to you to help foster that growth. Because for a lot of leaders, it's a new frontier and they don't necessarily know how to navigate that. And so um, again, we've specifically invested a lot more in a strong coaching program to support leaders as they navigate that. Okay. Um, Can I add something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I don't want to yeah. talk over you if you were going to, were you all going to share something else on that question? I, I want to share really quickly. Um, I'm sure you all have seen the news in the last several months or year. And um, I think that there are a lot of efforts to define what is diversity, equity, and inclusion in a negative way. And I do think one thing we have focused on more recently is making sure our leaders can articulate what is diversity, equity, and inclusion in a consistent way, and perhaps more importantly, the why behind it. And I would have told you that was important five years ago, but I think it's elevated and important. So providing our leaders with tools so that they can address questions that come up. There's a list of frequently asked questions and resources. I think that's important today. I anticipate that being more important as this year progresses as we get to the end of the year. So that's a piece of advice I would give you all to make sure you can articulate what your organization stands for in consistent fashion. Right. And define it for your organization. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Like don't just Google it. Like look up, like think about what it means and the impact that it has on your organization. Mm -hmm. Right. Bethany, were you going to mention, uh, uh, were you raising your hand? Or... Uh, no. Okay. All right. <laughs> add was I, I think there is something so important about keeping a pulse and giving people the space to share their opinions on what's happening within the organization mm -hmm. when you're actually helping create a, a culture of inclusion and belonging. It's interesting even within an organization that is all about helping other organizations become more inclusive and equitable. We ourselves are always trying to keep pulse of what are our employees saying as well? How do we help create a space where they feel heard, they can ask the questions that are difficult to our leaders and give very like real feedback to, to our leadership. So some of the initiatives we've also put in place are like ask me anything to our founders. We have biannual pulse surveys and I mean, we're only an organization of 35, but it's still so critical that we hear everyone's voice and ensure that some of the challenges are addressed in real time. So even taking that data-backed approach to what we're doing internally has been huge. Right. I'm going to um, 
uh, move on to the next question, um, uh, and this involves um, prior conversations or uh, with Bethany about inner work and the importance of inner work in, um, in when it comes to fostering workplace environments where inclusion and belonging um, can thrive. And just just share a bit of um, why you why you say that inner work is, is a good way to achieve that. Yeah, thank you. Well, we've heard a, a little bit of a theme here. Um, as we've talked about, um, what we're really talking about here is behavior change. And behavior change is slow at times. Not Sometimes not, but sometimes it's slow. You talked about going usually to- Usually slow. Usually slow, right. It's not, <laughs> not, not usually yeah. fast, yeah. And so you talked about going to the gym, right? I mean, I can barely get a gym routine going um, and I know it's really good for me. And, and what we're really talking about here is really deep shifting of mindsets, behaviors, and habits. We're talking about habits here, right? Um, mental habits, mental processes, mental models, to put it in a more scientific way. And so when we think about real behavior change, we have to create, and use that word again, we have to create space for someone to be self-reflective of what's coming up for them. Um, there's, you know, we hear a lot about unconscious bias. How do we become conscious of what is unconscious? That's inner work. It's inner work to become aware of things that we might not be aware of. Um, so we have to, we have to, I keep saying have to. Um, there are ways in which we can create some space for, for people to make mistakes. We've heard about psychological safety a moment ago. And that's really at the heart of it. What that term was, was born out of was the ability to fail in front of people and, and have it be okay. You can still show up at your job. You can still be a part of your team. You can still succeed. Learn from that failure. Fa fail fast, right? Um, and, and being able to build that inner resilience means that we can actually shift behavior when we make mistakes, not if. But when, when it comes to inclusion, we're going to make mistakes, things are gonna be difficult. Whether we're on a journey of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging or not, we're gonna have difficult conversations because we're all trying to work together. So it's going to be difficult. We're, we're human beings with emotions. And so when all of that starts to get activated, in these difficult, and it doesn't have to be difficult, but sensitive or new conversations, ultimately what's really happening is an individual is having an activated moment and for them to create some space to understand what's getting activated here, what does this mean for me, not someone else, what does this mean for me? That's inner work. So I've been on a long journey of that. I think it's a lifelong journey. I think it's a part of just being human and we're a bunch of humans trying to accomplish something in a business together. So it's complex and, and that inner work is gonna help us become able to, to navigate all of what we're talking about um, over time, yeah. I, I think we've also kind of alluded to culture um, as part of our discussion and um, Renee, I know this is uh, one of the things that you mentioned at, at Marvin um, is that the company is focused on culture. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about, again, the, the role that leaders play in establishing uh, that culture of um, um, fostering uh, diversity, inclusion, belonging, um, equity, and mm -hmm. making that also um, coincide with the, the company's goals. Mm -hmm. Well, culture is, um, at Marvin specifically, culture is an area where we had talked a lot about culture and we said, you know, we have a good culture, but up until recently, there really wasn't a clear definition of when we say culture, what do we mean? What does that include? And also, what is great about our culture? Or maybe what does need to be strengthened? And so we did some pretty extensive research to identify not only where our culture was strong, but also where those opportunities were with our culture. We then recently took a look at our latest five-year business strategy and really did a lot of examination to see what does our business need from our culture? What does our business need from our people in order to be successful? And we essentially layered those two and took the research, the opportunities, along with our five-year business strategy and created a pretty specific culture roadmap that centers around getting employees to think differently, to work differently, all in support of that business strategy. And then more specifically, as we've thought about establishing a definition of culture at Marvin, we've centered that around six different 
um, sort of fundamental areas. So a lot of times when we talk about culture, it's it's our values or it's our behaviors. But the reality is there are a lot of different elements beyond those two that make up culture. So at Marvin, we think about it in terms of communication, it's behaviors, it's the systems within which we're working, it's the symbols. So if you think about your daily work environment, what sort of symbols or cues are all around that are signaling what matters to you as an organization? Um, it's behaviors, but then it's also our energy. So how are our people feeling? Are they engaged? And so once we had a, a more specific definition and some really clear um, levers and areas to focus on, that's made culture an actual function from which we can strategically plan, again, all in support of the business. Right. Um, I want to ask um, Siham about um, just helping us get a grasp of some um, everyday kind of um, practical ways, as you mentioned, those daily workouts um, to and that consist of the exercises that can help leaders um, implement um, these strategies that, that we've all been kind of talking around. But just help us understand what's a, what's a daily regimen that, that can help um, leadership institute some of these uh, policies that maybe not really big things, maybe small little things every day. Practical things, yeah. It's, you know, when we talk about inclusive leadership or showing up inclusively, it, it can feel so loaded. When you break it down into, to your point, what are some just tactical daily things that you can practice, it feels a lot more bite-sized. So mm. I'll first steal from Bethany's point on like managing self and regulating self. So at Praxis, we have an internal curriculum team that's essentially defined a framework around inclusive leadership, and it starts with managing self, and that can tactically look like, how do you actually regulate your emotions on a daily basis? So quite literally taking breathing exercises when things might feel a little too difficult. How do you demonstrate empathy in a time where maybe you're being activated in a daily basis? But then also, how do you ask open-ended questions, like truly just questions that are not yes or no answers to understand who people are, what they're bringing into the workplace, what is fundamentally going on that might be driving some of their behaviors in your day-to-day -day work and in your conversations. Um, I think another very tactical thing is giving real-time and structured feedback. So we know that one of the biggest barriers to retention and growth is real-time coaching and development opportunities that's equitable and accessible for all. And a lot of times those things don't happen because we're scared to have the conversations. And so how do you on a daily basis think about what are the bite-sized opportunities for me to give structured, fact-based feedback in a way that helps create a sense of belonging and inclusion and investment in people's development. And I mean, and then the list can go on of a bunch of other things. You can, you know, think about how do you like practice apologizing, recognizing when you've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. But these are all bite-sized things that you can do in your day-to-day -day work, really, again, starting with asking open-ended questions to help people feel included and heard and seen in their, in their workplace. Right. Um, I want to give everybody a chance too to to kind of um, uh, in the remaining minutes we have just to give a uh, some parting kind of thoughts of um, and practical advice for for some of the folks here today that that you think are are useful um, and that can help them something to take back um, after today. Um, and I'll start, um, first I'll start Bethany with you and we'll work our way down. Oh, I was really hoping to hear from everybody else first. <laughs> I'm not no, kidding. I was like, I get to listen and ones. then, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think that there, there's a lot, there's a lot of tips, I guess. Um, but I think the, the thing that I'll, I'll stick with the theme here, I guess, that I'm bringing into today, which is um, creating some space. And I love the practical, practical tips that we just heard. Um, just space to regulate. I think that's a really, I'm just going to, I'm stealing from you. That's what, so I guess I did get to steal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite all right. Yeah. But I, I do think that, um, you know, you mentioned breath and um, there's all sorts of amazing research about how powerful breath is to regulate and to, to bring us into a little bit more focus. It can re-energize us after lunch, for example. So feel free to take some deep breaths. Um, <laughs> it's a powerful tool. It's, it gives us literal life. Um, and it's, it's that powerful even in the moment. So I would say just practically um, for you, for your teams, for your organizations, help them just create a pause, create space, 
take a deep breath. When you as HR professionals are noticing activation, allow that humanness to just be in the space. Bring in a, just a moment. Ask people what they need. Do you want to take a moment? Do you want to breathe? Right. What's going to be helpful here? Those are closed questions. How ca how can we help you in this moment? <laughs> so yeah, so create some some space um, for people to be human and and really just pause to reflect. Yeah, yeah. Renee, how about you? Sure. This uh, so a caveat. This is coming from someone who leads an internal communications function, but. <laughs> I do want to emphasize the criticality of consistent communications. And so when you're talking about establishing a DEI strategy, when you're talking about modeling certain behaviors, any one of these topics can have the tendency to fall flat unless there is strong communication with your employees about why we're doing this. Specifically, what behaviors do we want to see modeled? And with communication, I can't emphasize enough, you have to repeat it over and over again. The best thing you can have is someone who's sick of hearing why we're doing something. And so often we communicate a message a couple of times and we assume that it's resonated with people. So with any of these strategies, again, just really strong communication, not only about the what, but the why. Right. See him. See him. I would say practice and just reinforcing each of the different moments that you're trying to really get your leaders to practice, to implement in their workplaces and thinking about moving your learning strategies and your learning moments beyond just a one time opportunity, but a ongoing continuous practice so that they can build that muscle for how they actually apply it in their workplace. Thanks. Uh, Michelle. I have two things. The first one is I'm going to, I'm going to kind of Piggyback off what something Renee said, which is when you over communicate, you also have to tell them why. Um, we, <laughs> we found that we were over communicating things, but we weren't specifically saying we're doing this to be more transparent. So then people were like, well, I don't, I don't know. I didn't hear about that. I don't understand. So be intentional in your communicate over communication as well. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is that it all comes back to the leader. So making sure that everything that you do with your DEIB strategy um, starts with the frontline leader and then you layer things to hold them accountable. So being very specific in what you're identifying or excuse me, um, what you're defining a, an intentional leader as and then making sure that that is layered throughout everything you do, any training, any you know, performance metrics, um, performance review process, all of that. Make sure that it all connects and it all connects back to the values and the strategic priorities of the organization. And Joffrey, some parting words for, for the folks here today. I would say that this job is one of the best jobs that I've ever had. Um, it is also one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. I'm more great today than I was when I started it, and that is uh, <laughs> being honest. And I understand why. Um, I think that for some folks, DEI is the training we did last Thursday. We're all good. And for other folks, it's humanity, and why does it take so long? So the challenge becomes how much can the organization take at one time? How quickly can we go? You're doing too much. You're not doing enough. That is a very challenging space to work in. And with that said, um, that's why it's hard for me to say that data is the piece of advice that I do have because within our organization, I hate to bring data to something that is so human, but I think it's important with our organization. Uh, we often talk about what's measured gets done. Mm -hmm. And I do think that DEI, just like safety and your revenue goals and whatever else you track um, is important. And it doesn't have to be a hard and fast goal, a hard target. It can be aspirational. But as it pertains to diversity, there should be some type of a goal so you know whether you're making progress or not. As it pertains to equity, you should know whether you're paying people fairly or not. Are you advancing people? Are you giving folks the tools they need in order to be successful? As it pertains to inclusion, do you have a pulse survey? Do you have a climate survey? Do you know how people are feeling? If you have that data, you have the ability to be transparent and share how you are doing, what work you need to do, what you need to take on, or what successes that you do have. So. Um, I do think data is a part of this. I don't think it's the only part of the story. There's definitely a human side, but the more you can be transparent, identify where you are and communicate what work has to be done, I think that people have confidence in the work that you're doing and take it seriously. Right. Well, thank you so much. Um, in radio, this would be me ending a little before my post, but um, I always think it's important to also give a little time for the, uh, our next panel to, to get on the stage. Joffrey, thank you so much. Michelle, Saham, Renee. Bethany, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for being here.
Thanks a lot, y'all.